approached me, even though she presented as all my ideas, she really approached me because she wanted to do something about Ferguson and the cold of its birth. You know, we didn't feel that we could come together as historians and not talk about this uh, very, very important action, movement, activism, all the things that have happened that have had really uh, local, state, national, international significance. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity to have this kind of meeting of a, a discussion. Um, I think the chance to talk about the recent protest's meaning and to think about history's relationship to it and the knowledge that all of us bring as students of the past. So uh, the question about how to historicize Ferguson, to think about how we place it in history, what is its relationship to the long history of black struggle, what is its relationship to the civil rights and black power movement, and what is it in relationship to the multiple and successive domestic wars that we've seen launched against communities of color including the militarization of policing in response to the urban rebellions, the war on gangs, the war on drugs, the war on crime, and post 9-11, the war on terror. So in many ways, I think Ferguson raises a series of issues about really the rise of the punitive state uh, that we've all been suffering under in the last 50 years and, and before, of course, but really this acceleration of this thing that we call mass incarceration. So um, I'd like to start just by thanking our panelists for agreeing to participate. Um, if we could just I'll give them all a round of applause. Um, I'm going to provide you some short remarks, uh, which are really an impressionistic a view of uh, some of the protests that I attended in Ferguson last semester and uh, in mid-August. And then I'm going to introduce our panelists and then open it up to a discussion. I have some questions for them and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, I should say that one of our panelists is coming in late. He had to work tonight. Um, he should be in the next hour. Each generation has a moment when they share an instance of collective experience that is forever etched into their memory. For the civil rights and black power generation, it was unquestionably the open casket funeral of Emmett Till. Disfigured remains of this 14-year-old boy became a mirror in which black youth saw their most vulnerable selves. This site was so excruciating that it catalyzed direct action protest from rural Alabama to the streets of Oakland for nearly two decades. And something striking about that is that it's well known about how Emmett Till mobilized the civil rights movement, but also for the Black Panthers that I interviewed in Oakland, Emmett Till was also a definitive moment for them. Today, for a broad swath of people, ranging in age from those born in the waning years of the black power movement, through the interstice between the 20th and 21st century, this moment was Ferguson. The precise calculus of generation is elusive. As Jeff Chang has argued, generations are fictions. And yet we all have a personal and public sense of time that places us within a cohort of history. Whether we use the brand new terms, the hip hop generation or generation X, or the not-for-profit ring of millennial youth, Particularly for those of us who came of age under Presidents Ronald Reagan through Barack Obama, the events in the small municipality outside northern St. Louis were profoundly meaningful. It might even be said that the events of August to the present moment have helped distinguish these post-civil rights generations from their predecessors because the months of mass protest announced what many of us feel is the most pressing political crisis of our time, the emergence of a massive edifice of policing, surveillance, prisons, and punishment that is unprecedented in U.S. or global history. Built on the centuries-long substructure of white supremacy, but nurtured in an era of neoliberal retreat and technological advance, this massive state-building project, known alternately as mass incarceration, the new Jim Crow, the prison industrial complex, or more simply in Chris Hedges' words, the most advanced police state the world has known, has become a defining feature of our time. It is impossible to understand the enormity of the reaction to Michael Brown's murder without recognizing the daunting shadow cast by state repression in the 50-year aftermath of the modern civil rights movement. Like the body of Emmett Till, the painful image of a murdered youth left abandoned in his own pool of blood for five hours in the street was intolerable. First to the residents of Canfield Green where he lay, then through the digital magic of cyber networks to the rest of the city, the nation, and the world. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Vine carried this story beyond St. Louis's periphery and forced mainstream media to reckon with its gravity. 
Even more important to the impact and longevity of Ferguson as site of protest and mobilization was the ingenuity and commitment of the protesters who refused to leave, even when confronted with tanks, military hardware, and clouds of tear gas. Instead, they started counting the days publicly of sustained resistance, and in doing so, announced to St. Louis County and the rest of the world that well, they would not stop until they attained justice for Mike Brown and many others shot down by the police. And here we are in the 253rd day of protest. Renisha McBride, repent. 
and so it went on for hours in the rain. Whether out of guilt or frustration, I don't know, but tears streamed down the face of one of the Ferguson police officers as he and his colleagues formed a Billy Club phalanx blocking the entrance to the police station. They dressed in special neon yellow riot gear and plastic shielded helmets. Protesters and ordinary people created and maintained memorials in the place where Mike Brown's body lay, set up camp in front of the Ferguson Police Headquarters on South Florissant, and marched regularly along what a local minister called the Jericho Road, from Canfield to the edge of Delwood, a neighboring majority black municipality. For many days and nights, protesters manned pickets in front of the Ferguson Police Station for 21 hours a day, sharing rides and food as they crafted their own movement culture. This form of direct action spread to South St. Louis following the shooting of Ronder and Myers, whose sandwich had been mistaken for a gun. As this mosaic of struggle indicates, over the past year, Ferguson and the greater St. Louis metro area has become a laboratory and genesis point for a new generation of anti-state violence activists and for black power sensibilities, both for local youth and those across North America. These efforts and the national and international press and social media coverage they have generated marked a turning point, a before and after in which perception changed. On November 24th, the night of the grand jury verdict on whether or not to indict Darren Wilson, CNN viewership surged six to two, CNN viewership surged to 6.25 million, with the largest spike in viewers of ages 25 to 54. The audience easily exceeded that of midterm election coverage by over a million, million people. Solidarity protests in New York, Los Angeles, and other cities throughout the country immediately followed and in the process, a national collective memory was forged. This is not to say what happened in Ferguson was something entirely new. It certainly was not. Anti-police brutality protest has a long history, and a small segment of its most recent past could be traced as far back as the late 1970s and early 1980s to the police murders of Julia Love, Eleanor Bumpers, Michael Stewart, and many, many others. But I think to understand the dynamics of Ferguson and our 253rd day of protest, in the age of cyber networks and the aftermath of the Arab uprisings, we need to look to more recent struggles. The campaign seeking justice for Oscar Grant, Sean Bell, Troy Davis, Zakia Gunn, and Trayvon Martin strike me as a few of the direct lineal antecedents for the Ferguson protest. In fact, as we will be talking about and discussing tonight, Ferguson represented the culmination of both long-standing forces of repression and criminalization as well as resistance. And I just wanted to say a few words about that since I've uh, spent most of my youth being a Black Panther historian. And one of the things that's striking to me is that the kind of activism that the Black Panther Party engaged in today uh, would be met with unbelievable repression. I don't think it would even be possible. And so one of the things that Ferguson has made me think about is really the increase in state repression since the Civil Rights Movement. So talking about the development of SWAT as a response to the Watts Rebellion, at that point the largest civil disturbance in history, and this, this militarization of police and the development of new kinds of elite commando units. And I want to emphasize that because often when the history of militarization of policing is told, it's talked about as a post-9-11 phenomenon. But I think it's very important to go back to the late 60s and the early 70s and look at police responses to mass protests. So you have hundreds of thousands of people coming out in urban rebellions across the country. And the police response to that, I think, is very important for a, a very important foundational period for the militarization of policing. And then, of course, we have the war on gangs and the war on drugs, which I'm studying now. Um, I think many of the dynamics of the war on drugs are, in effect, are, and are shaping Ferguson protests. There are people that have been victims of the war on drugs that are participating in it. So I think that these multiple and successive domestic punishment campaigns are really important. Um, so it is a truism of left social history that repression breeds resistance. But the real question is not if, but when, and what conditions make this possible. The decades-long accumulation of police powers, and at a more foundational level, the elevation of punishment as the solution to all social problems is indeed daunting. I think that is why Ferguson has been so meaningful to all of us, to watch young people literally face down tanks and protest 21 hours a day in the quest for justice for one of their peers has shown us all that it's possible to fight back. I think that nested within Ferguson are a number of important issues. Fighting the militarization of police is paramount. But equally important is confronting the problem of policing for profit, as described in the recent DOJ report. Um, the DOJ report um, found everything wrong about the Ferguson PD, except the actual shooting of Mike Brown. But 
It does provide a systematic account of how the municipality of Ferguson and St. Louis County more broadly finances itself, to quote a phrase from Tony Morrison, on the backs of blacks. This larger problem that many have dubbed racial capitalism is key to understanding not only Ferguson, but the war on drugs, gangs, and crime. So what comes immediately to mind is asset forfeiture, which is essentially that um, if you are accused of a drug crime, that your property can be seized, and that can be everything from your iPhone, to your car, to your house. So this problem of racial capitalism um, is, is central, I think, to thinking about the background of Ferguson. We're dealing with systems in which racial capitalism is highly profitable. To push back against this, we need the kind of scrutiny that has been focused upon St. Louis County to be applied to policing practices across the country as well as the federal government. And we need to think about the dangerous mix of profit and racial subordination, which incentivize mass arrests and even killings in the years since the passage of the Voting Rights Act. The second point is that we need to recognize that each generation confronts the overarching structure of power in its own way. One of the most remarkable elements of Ferguson has been watching a whole cohort of activists emerge in little more than six months. Indeed, I saw activists emerging in two weeks when I first came. Women have been at the forefront of this, as have self-identified queer and transgender people. Black Lives Matter, whose hashtag was founded in 2012, later expanded to local organizing committees throughout the country, has foregrounded not only the need to stop arbitrary arrest, murder, and detention by law enforcement, but to think about the central role of gender and sexuality and how we value life itself. So finally, I think it's really important that um, if we only search for charismatic male leadership as our model of social activism, much of what's happening in this movement becomes invisible. And I think some of the most, the most new and vibrant parts of this movement are not only lost, but made invisible. Thank you. And sitting to my left is Kyla B. She was born and raised in St. Louis. She graduated, uh, after graduating in 2008 from Riverview Gardens High School, she attended St. Louis University, and there she developed her love to help people, which led her to studies in social work. She co-founded the university chapter of Strive for College, a mentor program which assists inner city youth with applying to college and creates a support network. She has volunteered with community building organizations such as Big Brothers and Big Sisters, and in response to the killing of Mike Brown and the inhumane treatment of protesters, Kyla began organizing actions including Occupy SMU and Think It's a Game. She has facilitated trainings and meetings to better equip the community with tools to maintain this movement and is now a field organizer for the Organization of Black Struggle, where she helps develop policy around police accountability and restores back power to the black working class. Missouri. He 
He's a hip-hop artist and wordsmith who has participated in the Ferguson protests since early October. He earned a degree in English from Harris Stowe Community College and is a school teacher by day and a hip-hop activist performer by night. <laughs> okay, so I think maybe I'll just start by posing some questions. Um, one of the most remarkable elements of the Ferguson protest was just watching how quickly a new, co a new cohort, a new generation of activists was forged. I was wondering if each of you could talk about your own process of politicization. Has, has it changed how you think about politics? And if so, how? Repeat the question So basically, I just want to know about your politicization about this process, how did you go through a process of politicization, and how has it changed the way you think about politics? What, is it, what did it mean to become an activist? Um, well, first of all, I want to say good evening, um, and thank you guys for having me here tonight. Um, and just for correction, it's Kayla Reed. Um, but August 8, 2014, I um, was a pharmacy technician. I had never been pulled over by the police. Uh, my father is a pastor of a Baptist church. So um, my politics um, had a lot to do with what we would call respectability. Uh, I believe that you graduate from high school, you go to college, you get a degree, you live what they paint for you is what they call the American dream. You keep your head down and you do what's right and you'll have a successful life. Um, I really wasn't engaged in politics outside of, uh, I was 18 the first time I got to vote, and the first time I voted was the presidential election for Barack Obama. Um, outside of that, I never had real interaction with the police. So on August 9th, 2014, um, I was at work at my second job, and I started to get all these notifications of something that was happening in the community that I grew up in. Um, Campfield Green Apartments, the, the children that grow up in that apartment complex go to the same school that I graduated from. My parents lived less than a mile away from where Mike Brown was killed um, in broad daylight. So the opportunity to go there was something I felt like I had to do. So uh, that day when I got off, I went to Ferguson and I felt um, something, it was the first time that I ever saw police in that manner, the militarization of police. I never had seen them respond to mourning in that capacity. Um, you see on television all the time when people riot police they give it, um, when white people write it, they give it this, oh, you know, kids just were upset about the game. Black people had just came out because someone's son had been killed and lied on the street for four and a half hours. So they were responded to by more municipalities than I can tell you. Um, there were dogs and cans of mace and things like that that I had never seen. And in that moment, I started to realize that there was a, there was a difference. You heard about the line in the sand, but then it actually got drawn that day. Um, that to be black in America was a, a sentence and sometimes it sentences you to death um, at the hands of police officers. And so I felt, to, I felt the need to continue to come out to be in community with the people who were fighting for what they really believed in. And what they believed in was the ability to simply live. Mike Brown had the right to be on that street that day. He should have been able to make it home and that wasn't given to him. Um, and so as those days passed on, I, I definitely say that I was starting to become politicized but I didn't become radicalized around politics until Von Derrick Myers was killed. Um, I often say that his mother and I worked together for three years. She literally sat in the cubicle next to me. So the night of Occupy Slew, um, they said that the Myers were there, that the family was there. And I was like, that's great. I'm very excited that they're here. I turned around and I looked this lady in her face. She was like, wow, I remember you. We worked together. And in that moment, I realized that it could have it, it could have easily been my brother. It could easily one day be my son. It could be my father. And how important it was that I stand to this work and I really start to look at what white supremacy means and what the history of politics um, for black people have been and how things have not really changed. Um, and so I think that th those moments define me as a person um, right now. It, it, really, it really made me decide to educate myself on systems and pledge my, my, the last 253 days of my life to breaking these systems down. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, well, first, I'm a 60s child. So when, when you talk about politics, 
You know, I grew up in a family that believed in voting, believed in knowing what the issues were in the community and being engaged. Um, so because I grew up that way, uh, when I lost, when, at one point in my life, I lost the, the right to vote. So now, you know, for me, it is very important that I'm able to express myself in the ballot, with the ballot. Um, but I only think of the political process as just part of the process. You know, um, a lot of times in our community and from the children that I know and the people that I grew up with, uh, we're never taught how the political process can move a community forward because we didn't get it in high school. If it was not for my parents and my aunts and uncles and the people I surrounded myself with, I wouldn't have known how important it was. And like I graduated in 81 and they still didn't teach us that in school. So um, I guess my love for the community and the work in the community came from me being an employee at the Grace Hill Settlement House, which is an organization in North St. Louis that does medical care, provides social services around every issue uh, you can imagine in our communities. Um, you know, I, I just, I don't know, the political process for me is just part of a process. You know, that is not the only thing. It is a very important part, but I don't see it as the only thing. And, and I think a lot of times now, because we talk a lot about, you know, getting out and registering people to vote. Okay, so it's real wonderful to register someone to vote. They get this wonderful little card that comes in the mail. Every time there's an election, they send you another card to tell you where you need to go. And all of that is fine and good. However, if we do not start educating people about the political process, it does not work. Because that's why the voter turnout and a lot of the neighborhoods are so low because people don't understand that they have power in a piece of paper or the electronic. They don't understand. So, you know, when we get out there, because I know when I was out there on West Lawson, uh, one of, another social service organization was had set up a table and they were registering people and I'm like, okay, well, that's fine. But if you're going to register people, then tell me who's going to do the educational piece. And they were stunned, like, what? And I was like, well, we can sit here and fill out a bunch of pieces of paper all day long, but if people don't understand the processes that go along with that, then what have we really done? We gave them a nice little card that comes in the mail, okay? Who needs something else in their wallet? Okay. You know, so um, again, the, the political process, like I said, I, I see it as being a part of a larger picture, but not the only thing. So I vote all the time. I, like I tell people, even if they're talking about the colors of trash cans, I want I want to pick my color too. You know, and I want to vote. So you know, I make sure that it doesn't matter. Like we just had an election a little while back. Uh, I'm thinking I'm going in to vote on some stuff. It was two things on the ballot. I'm like, really? Just two things? So I was in and out within five minutes. You know, but it's really important that we exercise that right because people died for us to be able to do this. And so that's why it's so important, if for no other reason. But there, there's a lot of other reasons that I could probably sit here and name. But, so. Thank you for that. Our third panelist. Our third panelist is, is here. Welcome, Bo. Hey, how's everybody doing? Such a smooth talk. Sorry, I'm late. discussion about Twitter and about social media and um, I was wondering if you guys could talk about the ways that you use social media in order to get the word out and also how it influenced your own activism and politics and some of the practical ways that you use it. I know that um, in talking with some of the organizers that 
Twitter has, it's very useful for some things and not for others. And I was just wondering if you guys could all talk about that. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so on August 8th, I had a Twitter, but I stopped using it. I was like a Facebook person. Um, and I think it was probably once we transitioned, uh, once I started to see that, once we started to really get involved with the militarization of police, um, we would often like take pictures and record things, um, and I would put them on Facebook. Um, and I, I was really starting to see that I was like scaring my dad because we're friends on Facebook. <laughs> so I was like, this isn't working. I can't. If I wasn't posting something on Facebook, he was like calling my cell phone. So I just, and then I started hearing that you know like Twitter it reached more people, and you know the hack, you know Facebook is kind of your friends. They have some algorithm that makes you see people that you only want to see. Um, and not all the people that you are. So when I got on Twitter, I reactivated my account, and it was just literally a couple tweets a day. But I would step out, I would step uh, to the side and take a picture of people, or um, send a message about what was going on. And I started to see how many people were tuned in to to seeing the truth of the matter. Because the power of social media has, in reality, um, told a story that mainstream media didn't want to tell. Um, and they, they call the protest, they call us radical and says we would kick CNN off the lot. We definitely told KMOV and Fox locally that they're not welcome at protests because they pick a narrative to tell the story from and that is not the truth of what just happened. Um, and so when you refer to people who are risking their lives for justice as looters, then you are no longer welcome in the community that we were developing as protesters. Um, so social media allowed us to tell our truth. Um, and Twitter allowed us to reach a larger group of people. You have some Twitter, Antonio French is probably the, uh, the best example on Twitter I can give you um, because he now has over 100,000 followers on Twitter. That means during the early weeks of um, Ferguson, after Mike Brown was killed, over 100,000 people tuned in to hear what he was saying, to see what he was saying, to, to stay locked in. You have like local uh, people, people like Tefpo, Netta DeRay, who have over 30, 40, 50,000 followers at this point because people have been engaged. I want to hear the opinions of people who are actually like out there doing the work. Um, so I have about 6,000 followers. And so I, I, I don't tweet as much as I used to, but during uh, actions and things like that, we definitely have, uh, I think that we kind of know each other's roles. Um, so if I'm there and there are people like Netta and Ray available, then I'll live tweet because what it does is actually maintain the facts of what's going on. Um, and it allows people to hear our voices because reporters come out and you can talk to them for five minutes, you watch it on the news and they take 20 seconds of what you said and it could have been one line that just didn't sound quite right and that's the main story. Um, and so it's definitely been able to preserve our truth and social media is, is our generation's way of communicating. And, um, and I think that we've been able to educate and reach people and humanize protesters in a way that mainstream media didn't do. And that's been, uh, it's been very necessary to keep this movement alive. Uh, with social media, it helped us reach people all over the world who uh, wasn't um, aware of what was going on or was just watching like CNN and only hearing bits and pieces of uh, the whole situation in Ferguson. So, uh, Myself and a guy named Haku, we were out there since day one and we would just record everything that was going on, whether it was something peaceful or whether when the, or when the cops were like shooting tear gas and things at us, everything we recorded and we uploaded it. And when we did that, uh, people from all over the world was tuning in, they were sharing it and commenting and voicing their opinions. So social media is definitely important in this generation. Uh, it helps everybody connect and see what's like really going on, especially during crisis like the Mike Brown situation. So it's very important. Okay, and for me, uh, I've always had Twitter, I've always had Facebook, um, but Kayla just uh, said that we know, we all have our roles. That's not my role, okay? <laughs> The only reason when I'm out that I carry my phone is just so that I'll know where my people are. Yeah. Okay, that's the only reason I have my phone. I'm not, I don't, 
because I focus more when I'm in the streets um, on what's going on around me, making sure that other people are safe um, and being a support. So, you know, like she said, we have, we have people that are out there that are on their phones from the moment they jump out of the car to the moment we leave whatever action we're at. And, and that's what I, I want them to do that. But that's not for me because first of all, I believe in having face-to-face -face conversations, blame that on me being a 60s child. You know, uh, I believe we need to talk. I don't, I don't like sharing everything on social media because I see it as a necessary evil, because just like we know what's going on, the people that we don't want to know, we don't want them to know what's going on, oh, they know what's going on. Because we have been to actions before where he, we have sat down, planned actions, we get there, the police are there before we are. You know, and that's not always good, because when we're in the streets and we're being defiant, okay, um, yeah, we, we definitely be defined, okay? <laughs> um, you know, it, it, to, so to me, everything does not need to be shared on social media. Some things we need to sit down. I say we need to get back to learning Morse code, <laughs> you know, or something. We need another mechanism to tell everybody where to be, what time to be, what we're wearing, whatever it is. Because <clears throat> when you're in a movement this large with so many organizations, I see it as being necessary for that, but the, but the details, I, I don't like to see the details of stuff on social media, I just don't. You know, because again, I don't want to pull up and the first person that I see or the first thing that I see is a police car and a policeman, because then that means our action is about to go south real quick. You know, uh, they try to make us have a peaceful, well, yeah, we are peaceful to a point. You know what I mean? We're not like out there trying to kill them or nothing. But, you know, I, I don't see the purpose of us being out there as much as we've been out there and just comply with everything they say either. You know, uh, I have to be grateful that I've never even been in jail. You know, uh, never. Since, not since August the 9th. You know, so I guess that's a plus. But, it's so, I don't know. Social media media has its place, and it's just not for me, especially when I'm in the streets. And, and then I want to say that we were giving, you know, this is a panel, so I want to give you the beautiful aspects of social media. The, there's a real thing called a troll. Um, there are real people, um, like I said, for me, if I have 6,000 followers, I have over 12,000 people blocked on Twitter because of the racial slurs and ignorant statements that they made toward us. Um, and so that, that's just amazing. Um, and then also, one of the, and I think that this was part of your question that I did not answer, is that when you have a lens into something and it's a non-stop lens, you do see the actions, but you also see the downtime that exists between actions. And you also see the, the uh, drama and the disagreements, all of those things do spill out on Twitter, mm -hmm. which sometimes is uh, detrimental to the work that we're doing. Um, but it is the reality. And so what it further does is it humanizes us, that I cannot be a machine um, to just to continue to push back against police brutality and not be, not have my own emotions and not have a place for me to let those go. So there, there, there are parts where Twitter has backfired, definitely so, um, on some of the things that we're trying to push against. But that's the reality of being a human in this, is that we are capable of making mistakes, but our mistakes shouldn't count us out for what we're fighting for. Um, and so that balance of figuring out what to tweet and what not to tweet um, is definitely something that we're learning 253 days in. Um, but it is some, it's the reality of, of, our, of, of my generation is that if I feel a way, I can put that on Twitter. But sometimes what I feel, everyone that's looking into this as a representative of the local movement, I don't need to say. Um, because I guarantee you, if the civil rights movement would have had Twitter, <laughs> right? It wouldn't have been, you know, if they would have had Instagram, if they would have had mine, if, if Martin and Malcolm would have been able to tell you everything that they felt every time, not just when they were standing at the podiums, then you, you definitely would have a different opinion. But the reality is that it humanizes us and it creates 
it allows so many voices to be, um, so many voices out there that this movement has been able to stay leader, leaderful and not one charismatic person at the top because you can tune into who's like a lot like you. So if you're someone who was born in you know the 60s and you you totally agree with what's happening right now, then you can follow with Beverly and then you get you get an opinion that's something like yours, right? You get to tune into it. You're not just giving what people give you. You can search your truth and you can follow the people whose story you want to hear. And it's really humanizing quality because CNN will tell you that we are monsters. And that's not what we are, right? And Fox will tell you that we are anti-police, but really we're pro-accountability. So I'm not saying that police officers should just poof and just, maybe I'm saying that. But what I'm <laughs> but maybe in my mind, but in the reality, police officers will stay. But what I want are more accountable police officers, better trained police officers. And so when we say uh, FTP, we really mean the culture that police has created that's, that kills and silences and tries to manipulate black people. Um, and so like, but Twitter has allowed us to do that in a real way. And so it has its pros and cons, but what relationship does not, like what thing that, our cell phones pros and cons, it can help you call the police and then it can also get you into an argument because you're looking at it too much. You're not supposed to have it at work. So it's just restricting it. And we're learning how to do that. One thing I wanted to follow up about that is that there's a project going on in Washington University called Documenting Ferguson, and they're trying to create the first Twitter archive as a way to help in using storyline and trying to integrate traditional archival sources with Twitter and other digital media. So I think that in some ways this is a history that's going to be told through digital media, research through digital media, which has all the advantages and disadvantages uh, that we're talking about tonight. Um, the next question is a way to try to remedy the selective coverage. I think that everyone is involved in the protests has experienced that you have many different actions going on every day, many at the same time, but the media is very selective in the ones that, it, that it's chosen. And I was wondering if each of you could, could tell us about your favorite protest action. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I would, I would say uh, one of my favorites is the shutting down of highways. Something about that feels like Furious 7, is that the name of the movie? <laughs> um, yeah, something about it feels just like that. Um, I drive a um, 1999 Ford Expedition, so I have a pretty big vehicle, okay? And, um, and I drive pretty well. Okay, and uh, so when we first, uh, when they first came up with the idea to shut down, start shutting down major thoroughfares through the St. Louis region, I was on board. I want to be one of the first cars out there. You know, I'm always either, I'm always either the buffer from the police and the people, or I'm leading the way. So, you know, I think for me, that's pretty much, that's the best part for me. Yeah. <laughs> You know, because then I'm actively, I am definitely actively engaged. Um, like standing in front of the police department, I really don't get anything out of that. Uh, I might walk up to them, talk to them a little bit, you know, ask them different questions. And then I'm standing on the sidelines, you know. But, yeah, shutting down streets. I like shutting down streets. <laughs> yeah, I like shutting down. Um, so my favorite action, um, Occupy Salute, um, I think it's a game. I think that that is my favorite because we finally had an opportunity to really get into the city of St. Louis. Ferguson uh, definitely has some targets, but, you know, small, because it's like five, seven blocks, like every other municipality in St. Louis County. It's uh, not very large, but when we... Um, when we started protesting in Shaw, um, it opened up a lot more targets, so we were able to uh, hit a lot more destinations. So I think that one of the, during Ferguson October, we did the uh, one action, so it was a bunch of us that were down there, uh, Freedom Fighters, um, Tribex, um, and we started, we all sent out the exact same tweet. And, 
at the exact same moment. And all these people who were in town came down to Shaw. And what we decided to do was take the group and split them into two and take them in two different directions to the same destination. I enjoyed this actual one because the police just didn't know what to do. Um, they were just completely thrown off. Um, and it was kind of like we had a tactical team. Um, the night before Occupy Sue, there was an Occupy QT, and all we literally did was take maybe 200 protesters to the quick trip, and we got like rolled up on in three seconds. I've never seen like a middle school, like they ran, they were running down the hill putting on riot gear, and all we were, we were we were just standing on the parking lot. So the next day we occupied, we shut down the street, and we started playing double dutch and hopscotch and uh, chanting, you think it's a game, you think it's a joke. And then the other group kind of went through this real um, neighborhood area. And so we met on Grand, which is a really big street in front of SLU. And the first group got there 10 minutes before the second group, and it was like a line of police officers. And one of the people um, who we were leading with were like, man, I don't know if we're gonna be able to make it. And we look over to the side, and here comes this other huge group that had like doubled by the time we left the first group. And it was like they were coming over the Calgary. It was this fog and here like here are these protesters coming out like chanting and that moment where these two groups like merged together um it definitely felt like people power it felt like there was nothing that could stop us and in that moment um and so to be a part of the organization of that and then to see it all the way through was was definitely my favorite thing can i ask a follow-up question about that occupy st louis at occupy st louis university is that right. right can you explain what that relationship is of the campus to that protest so SLU is a half, like maybe a half a mile from where Von Der Myers was killed, maybe. Um, there were two things. Uh, one, uh, we needed something, a target that was close, and we wanted to get the, the college students involved. In St. Louis, when you, if you're from out of town and you come to St. Louis and you go to one of the universities, they quickly tell you, like, put a bubble around you. Mm -hmm. Like, if you go to Wash U, you go to Wash U, you, you do what Wash U students do, and that's it. You don't really communicate or interact with just St. Louisans. If you go to SLU, they teach you the same thing. You stay within the college circuit. So even when you drive down the central corridor of St. Louis City, you see that most of the money goes into developing that area because those are where the colleges are. Um, and so we wanted an opportunity to really call out the college students to get involved in this. Um, one, because you know SLU, had, like, SLU has a lot of on-campus housing. And so one of the chances was out of the dorms and into the streets. Um, and then we found out that my dear and my senior actually works for St. Louis University. Um, and then on a personal note, I just owed him $27,000, so I just wanted to mess it up. That was a personal reason for me, but it definitely was, it definitely, it was, we knew that it would, it would be very powerful. SLU is a social justice institution. Um, that's some of the things that they pride themselves on is being able to do social justice work. Um, and so we knew that going to the center of the campus will call to attention, uh, like activating their communities. And they have some great demands that the students have now asked for in response to Occupy SLU. Um, and so there's been a, a communication between protesters and students um, since that moment. And it's been, uh, so I think that that's like one of the greatest things that we can do is activate young students. Student debt seems to be a common thing yeah. of Occupy. Um, my favorite moment was when we shut down the malls and stores on Black Friday. Just that whole weekend, man. That was, that was marvelous. <laughs> it, was just, it was just funny seeing everybody's faces when we went in there and we, you know, we would put stuff in baskets and then we'd just drop to the floor and everybody would be like, what's going on? And people would get up and be like, hey, hey, ho, ho, crooked cops got to go. We'll do that. Then the cops would come in and then we'll leave go right to another store and just do that for the whole day. And uh, also it was one a uh, couple weeks prior where uh, we went to Walmart on West Florissant and uh, we was told that that Walmart in particular uh, had funded the Durham Wilson uh, donation. I think they funded like a couple thousand. So what we did, we had a whole bunch of people go in. They filled the carts up like all the way. And then they went to the, uh, you know what I'm saying, the cashier. And then they was like, oh, I forgot my wallet. And then they went out and never came back in. So they were doing that the entire day. And then I think by 6 p.m., like that Walmart like shut down, like they closed. So that was pretty cool. 
That's my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> Seems that Walmart has been a consistent um, flashpoint of protest. There was a protester that I met in October who went into Walmart to purchase batteries for his bullhorn at 8 a.m. in the morning, and he was immediately arrested by the police. And he was just trying to get batteries. So Walmart is, um, it's a consistent theme, and we might think about that, because it does seem that, you know, this leads into the next question. I'm curious about how you see different issues, one, economic issues, how they play into this. Walmart does seem that it's a consistent site of conflict. Also, uh, in talking to protesters, I met a lot of people that were active in the $15 an hour campaign for fast food, so the service workers. And I guess the third piece was thinking about people that have felony convictions. Something that I was struck with were the discussions that I had with people about what it means to have a felony conviction to be shut out of the legal economy and how this protest helps give voice to that. So the economics. The economics. Um, yeah, I, I, the thing about Walmart uh, for me, um, because it is a retail giant, and yes, uh, we did get information that they had uh, given money to Darren Wilson. Um, and the thing is, you know, I think that's what upsets us about that is that how is it that you can pay or give money to this man who has killed someone? You know, if, they, you, if, if somebody came to your store and they shoplifted something, you're going to call the police, they're going to be arrested, you know, uh, charges are going to be filed, they got to go to court, you do all of this stuff. Now, you got this police officer, for, to me, for no apparent reason other than he's a police officer, you give him money and you don't even know if this man is going to even be charged with anything. So, so it sends a message that you really don't care, you know, but we are the ones that made you billionaires, okay? Do you understand that we are the ones that make sure that you get to still drive business? And I don't think that they make that connection, and if they don't make the connection, it's that they don't care. They just don't care, you know? So my thing is, why should I continue to spend my money with a retailer or anybody for that matter that does not care about me, you know. Um, so, the, so the economic uh, piece is, is really important. You know, I really don't know why we targeted QT other than the fact that um, misinformation was given out. Because when I was out there on Sunday, QT is Quick Trip. Quick Trip, yes. Uh, when I was out there that Sunday, I sat right across the street from the QT that burned down on West Lawson. And so, you know, I needed to understand, so why are we looting and taking stuff out of the quick trip? Uh, because the misinformation went out that QT is where the entire incident unfolded with Michael Brown and Steele, okay, which was totally false, okay. How that information got disseminated throughout the community, I have no idea because uh, I was not around that Saturday afternoon. Um, Not so I don't know. I mean, economics plays a part because, you know, we want to feel like we're a part of this society. And I want my money to mean more than just, again, the house that you live in, you know. Because um, personally, I live in the city of St. Louis, and I will travel to the county. I buy my gas in the city. Uh, when I need to park from my car, I buy it in the city. See. But again, it goes back to education because I understand that every dollar that I spend in my community stays in my community. See, I understand that part. But again, I don't think a lot of people understand that they just go wherever, you know. Um, so the economic base, you know, um, in the city of St. Louis is horrible, you know. But for every dollar I make, I at least spend 70 cents of it in the city of St. Louis because that's where I live. You know, those are the streets that I drive. So, you know, I, I want that, uh, I want things in the city to be okay for me. Uh, they talked to, you mentioned uh, Von Derrick Myers over on um, Shaw. You know, I, I even spend money in that neighborhood only because again, it's the city of St. Louis. You know, um, 
we need to start taking better care of the places where we live, you know, because the city looks horrible. You know, if you all get an opportunity to take a ride around, uh, go to North St. Louis and go, go, go to North St. Louis. <laughs> I ain't going to tell you to go by yourself, but go in groups. Um, and just look around and see how we live. And, and it's sad, you know, that we, uh, I was in Jefferson City about three weeks ago, and I was meeting with the uh, the Black Caucus for Jeff City. And uh, one of the things that gentleman said to me was that, you know, in Kansas City, we have political capital. In St. Louis, which is bigger per capita than Kansas City is, we have no political capital. And I was like, wow, wow. We need to do something about that, you know? Because we send those people up to Jefferson City to sit in those little bitty offices to make all, to make all these laws and change stuff. And uh, we have nothing to show for it. So, you know, it's getting to a point for me, I would rather keep my money in my pocket and start saving, build a business from the ground up, do something, uh, help somebody else and uh, get back to some economics that makes sense for us because we like spending money. One thing I know about it, we like spending money. You know, because we like nice cars, we gonna wear some clothes, okay? And us ladies, we gonna keep our hair done, we gonna buy purses, some jewelry, okay? So, you know, it's, I, I guess I'm getting to a point in my life where all those things ma matter to me less because of what else is going on around me. You know, uh, if I can't eat, I mean, if you can't eat, then I shouldn't be eating like I eat. You know, I need to be helping you eat, which helps me eat too. You know, and we so we need to start changing the way we think about our money. You know? So I'm giving people who care something about us. Um, yeah, so I took a couple notes. Um, number one, for this one, because it was like a few points that I wanted to make. Uh, one, Walmart became a uh, focal point of the protest because of John Crawford. Um, and we were able to tie the killing of John Crawford and Walmart um, to the reality that capitalism is uh, an effect of white supremacy, in my opinion. Um, and so that was one of the reasons that we originally started protesting at Walmart. And when we, when we look at what black liberation actually is, which is what we all struggle to accomplish, which is why I believe that we're all fighting, um, you have to look at economic justice. Economics say that black women and black men make less than white women and white men. Um, and so it leaves them access to less paying jobs like uh, fast food work and uh, retail work and uh, large companies that pay very little to their employees. Um, so when, when a black woman makes 73 cents compared to a white man that makes a dollar 10, you start to look at how economic justice actually ties into racial justice and how those two things, um, how those two things play into the system that oppresses black people. Um, and then I wanted to bring up Qu Quick Trip. Quick Trip um, was not a big deal for me, but I think what Quick Trip, the reason that it upset so many people was because CNN didn't get here to Quick Trip burn. You didn't see on national news a young man laying in the middle of the street. You saw a building burning. And the issue with that, and the reason that Quick Trip keeps coming up as a theme is because in that moment we realized that property was more important than black bodies. Um, and that a building burning meant more to, the, to this capitalistic country that we live in than black lives being killed every 28 hours. Um, which is why they quickly started calling us looters, right? Which is why when we knew, it wasn't, all the media people didn't come here on November 24th because they thought Darren Wilson was going to get indicted. White supremacy tells you Darren Wilson was never going to get indicted, right? Like, they, we all do that. Um, we fought against it because we want to see change, but the reality is because the system has not changed, we knew Darren Wilson would go free. Not only did he go free, people gave him money to kill black people which reinforces this economic justice that uplifts people who kill black bodies. Um, and so when all these newscasters came back on November 23rd, 24th, every interview that I had before that time, the one question, so what are you gonna, what's gonna happen with the rioting? Rioting is news, right? Paint blackness as a dangerous 
um, as, a, as, as criminal, as threatening, and your viewers will go up, and it reinforces the idea that black people are not human and do not deserve equal rights to the things like economic justice. Um, and so property, for people who are the chiefs of police, our mayor, our governor, preserving property is why the National Guard came in, not preserving life. Um, and then preserving white property is why the National Guard came in. Because if you drive down West Florida, it's not white businesses that got burned, it's small um, minority businesses that suffered, and the, the, the majority of the consumers that went to these businesses were black people. Right, so this, these are symptoms of a, of a system that's set up to separate blacks and whites. And so Quick Trip, Walmart, economic justice, all these things do play into white supremacy. And all these things need to be destroyed in, in the fight for black liberation. And so that, like to me, once you start dialing those things together, how education and poverty and crime, all those things co correlate together. It oppresses the black voice, it silences the black voice, and it tells you that everything is more important than black life. And that's why we continue to protest against it. piggyback off her where she said uh, how they value like businesses more than black lives Mike Brown was killed what two days and then before they even said anything about him so uh, yeah it was like that weekend we had a, a march in Ferguson and then that's when the uh, the rioting or, or looting took place that's when they start to cover the story and what the news didn't tell you it wasn't black people that started like the riot. It was a white guy who shot off a flare gun, and then that's when the cops started, you know, shooting the tear gas and stuff like that. And uh, I seen the guy. He ran up to the quick trip, threw something at it to break the glass, and then that's when all mayhem broke broke loose. And then I seen another guy, a white guy. He had on a mask and a hoodie. He had a bat. Cracked the Channel News 5 uh, window and ran off. And then that's how the mayhem started. Then you seen people come in and, you know, do what they do. So um, the news definitely didn't say anything about that. And it was, it's been more than one occasion where they, you know what I'm saying, came to protest to start stuff. So it's not us that was going around, you know what I'm saying, acting out of control. I believe they had people, you know, there to make us act a certain, certain way. Um, and you said something about like in, uh, inmates and things like that. Yeah, just about the question of people with felony convictions, where that fits into to Ferguson, the legacies of the war on drugs, war on crime. I've seen a lot of people, um, you know, that have uh, felonies and things. They have came out to the protests and stuff, to you know, what I'm saying be a part of something great and try to make it, let their voices be, be heard. Because a lot of people with felonies, they don't have, the, they can't get good jobs, they're looked out as outcasts and things like that. So this was like one of their ways to, you know, say like I've changed or, you know what I'm saying, I'm not a bad person and I want to help out my community and things like that. So I think that, that was pretty cool as well. As far as Walmart is concerned, uh, if you go to like a lot of these Walmarts, the majority of people that you see are you know, blacks and Hispanics. Um, so I find it kind of messed up that they even did that to you know support the Darren Wilson Foundation, especially the one on West Florissant. That's in a predominantly black neighborhood. So that was just a spit in the face. So you know that's all I gotta say about that. Um. And, and to that part, too, uh, when you talk about uh, people with felonies, you know, one of the things that she did not read about my, in my bio is that I am a convicted felon. Um, in 1995, uh, I was charged at WIDA, and my sentence was an SIS with a five-year backup probation, blah, 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 blah. Um, and, you know, that... It still haunts me to this day. It does not matter that for 10 years of my life, being a divorced mom with these daughters, I worked a full-time and sometimes a part-time job, and I went to school for 10 years straight. 
So I went from having a high school diploma to receiving a master's degree in 2009. I worked, I worked my best because in my life, I messed up, okay? I messed up, okay, so we know it. But are you gonna convict me of that every time I go to look for a job? Every time? Okay, you know, so what I say to the system is this. So you, you say that your system that you put in place does not work? Oh my God. Because what you told me to do was rehabilitate. I can't think of a better scenario for rehabilitation than for somebody to change their entire life around, go from point A to F, and you still, the only thing you see on my application is that box that I have to check. That's the only thing you see, really. So, you know, I, uh, Grace Hill, you know, there is not too much that they could ask me to, to do that I wouldn't because they gave me an opportunity. I still have, right now, I applied for clemency in 2004. Every couple of years I call the governor's office and I say, okay, so where are we at? Well, you know, I'm still sitting on the desk, okay, in a file, really. And we're talking about a class D felony. We, that's the lowest class, is that the lowest class? I don't even know, but it's so low that you mean to tell me that you're going to hinder any progress that I could make of being a productive member of this society for a class D felony? Wow. You know, um, and they gave me an opportunity. Like, I, like she read, I, I worked for Grace Hill for 20 years. I started at a $3 and $35 minimum wage job to a $55,000 a year position. You know, they, because what they said was, we see the paper, we know what you wrote, but we watch what you do. So, you know, because they gave me the opportunity, I am truly grateful, but look at all of the people that are out here that have not had that opportunity. You know, what do we do with these people? You know, because they have a lot to offer. People just don't want to give them a chance. Why? Because you're, you're afraid of them? You're afraid of us anyway. They don't want to sell you may as well give food. Because the narrative that they make about us, because see, these narratives that I keep hearing are not surprising to me. You know, you're afraid. I was afraid. Uh, he reached for them. They did. Because we are already demonized to society from the world go. So it's like when the moment that we are born on this earth, you know, we have all these strikes against us with nobody even taking the opportunity to even get to know us. Where we come from, what, what, what we've been exposed to, you know, cause like I grew up in the county in the 60s, not St. Louis City where everybody, everybody thinks I was. I grew up in North County, okay, and you know, for those of the people sitting in the room, that's significant in St. Louis, Missouri. You know what I mean? My father made the money to put us in a place where he thought that we were going to have peace. Well, we didn't get that much, you know, being the only black family on an all-white street. But it was eight of us, so, you know, people wasn't too quick to bother us, you know. <laughs> so, you know, the, these narratives that we keep on painting of people, we keep saying we want to give people an opportunity, but then we don't. You know, because we all got some prejudice in us somewhere about something. You know, and we have to start looking at us, not the rest of the world. Start looking at yourself, seeing where your flaws are, work on them, and then move on. Maybe then that thing will touch somebody else that will touch somebody else and become the domino effect that we need in this entire country. So we're, because we're moving up on 9.30. Okay. So I want to make sure that we have some time, at least to have some questions for the audience. We started late, uh, so, but I, we started about 15 minutes late. So if it's all right with everyone, can we take 15 minutes?
to have some discussion. I want to make sure that we get a chance to have some feedback. But um, can we have a round of applause for Kelly?